Leaning on Jesus. One of the, one of the easiest things to do is to get, one, get someone saved. It's one of the easiest things to do. To get Christ in them. One of the hardest things to do is to get them to understand what it means now that Christ is in them. It takes you three seconds to get saved. It takes you a long time to come to a revelation of who you really are in Christ Jesus. When we were here Wednesday night and we were worshiping the Lord, and I don't remember what the song was, but I remember what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I'm going to use that as my springboard for you tonight because it was revelation knowledge that came. It may not be to you. You may say, oh, yeah, I knew that. That's good. Praise God. But I had never thought about it this way. The Lord told me, I am preparing my bride to see me. But not in the way you've always thought. So I was, then I was like, okay, what have I always thought about the way the Lord prepares a bride? Think about when you grew up in church. Here's how you thought about it, most likely. Live cleaner. Quit cussing. Right? Quit being mean to people. Be a giver. Right? Act like Jesus. He's getting you ready. And the Lord, and the Lord and during that time, the Lord spoke to me and said, that is not me getting you ready. I have already done all of that through the work of the cross. Getting you ready means to get you to understand that you are ready. Having the mindset of who we really are in him. That we are as clean as we're ever going to be. That we are as holy in him as we will ever be. We cannot be more holy than we are today. We can only act more holy. We can only respond more holy. But our holiness comes from the Father. It is imputed righteousness means that Jesus took his right standing with God and he just poured it into us and he made us 110% perfect in him before the Lord. Jesse Duplantis had a trip to heaven. How many of you ever heard of Jesse Duplantis when he went to heaven? And the Lord brought that back to me as I was uh, thinking about it. Uh, he said that as he was there, he would see people coming into heaven, and some of them, they would just take off running to the throne room of God. He said they would have these long robes on, robes of righteousness. There's long robes on, and they would just take off running to the throne room. And he said, man, they would, they would you know, kind of like Elijah did when he was out running that chariot in the Old Testament. He, picked, he pulled up his, uh, his uh, robe from the bottom and pew, took off running, right? And he said that's what, what he saw. But he saw some people getting out, and they would kind of look around like they couldn't believe they were in heaven. You don't want that to be you. Couldn't believe they're in heaven, but they, they, they didn't have on a robe of righteousness. They had on a gown of salvation. A gown and a robe is two different things. And so he said those people that didn't have a, that weren't like whoosh, running to the throne room, he said they would get out and they would look around and they would kind of find their way and they'd start heading to the throne and they'd walk along the river of life. Oh, I love that. And they would eat from the trees. It says the, the, the leaves of the trees on the river of life brings healing to the nations and they would partake of it and as they partook of it they got stronger and stronger they were to keep moving they were to get and and the angel told jesse to plan you may or may or not may or not may or may not believe this but i want you even if you don't believe that he went to heaven i want you to think about this he said as those people were slowly moving to the throne there were other people taken off to the throne and the angel told him he said everybody that gets here they're making a trip to the throne room. That's where everybody wants to go. They're all work, but some people are taking it, have to take it slower than others. And the Lord asked me this when I was standing. I was right about here when He asked me this. He said, "Why is it that some have to move slower than others? Are the ones in the gowns any less clean? Are they any less righteous? Are there levels? Does God allow some people in and they can come to this level?" Some, and this is what the Lord told me. He said, the only difference between those two types of people is the person wearing the robe of righteousness has become aware on earth who they are in Christ. So now they just run to the throne. And these other people have really struggled with their identity. They don't really know who they are. So they get there and you still have your soul intact. Come on. Your mind, your will, your emotions, they're still intact. And if you don't really know who you are in Him, then you're going to think, well, I've got, 
I don't know. I've got to wrap my mind around this. I say we wrap our mind around it right here and now. So that when we step into glory, we all, this entire church, picks up our robes and just starts running to the throne room. That's my goal, to get you to that place. Everybody within the sound of my voice, so confident in who they are in Christ Jesus, that when they step out, bam, bye. And all the people said, yeah, they've been attacking you for believing what you believe, will be eating fruit all the way. They're still going, but they're having to transform their mind. Another man that went to heaven, and I've read every book I could ever find about people who went to heaven. I was in for about two years. It was a great example of this. He said that there was a woman that was there. He had had, I don't know if he's in a vision or he was there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But he said he was in heaven, and he said there was a woman there, and he said, and I've heard this from multiple uh, witnesses, he said that when someone's about to come cross over into that realm from earth into heaven, he said they'll have family waiting on them and loved ones. And they'll know they're coming, right? Like if Dylan was to drop dead today. If he's young and healthy, that's why I say that. If Dylan was to drop dead today, then all the loved ones he's had that's went to glory, they'd get a notice, hey, Dylan's coming. And they'd all be, oh, Dylan's coming. And they'd go run down to meet him, and they'd wait right there at that, whatever you want to call it, that gate or that portal. And they'd be waiting on him. And when Dylan stepped in, they'd go, Dylan! And he'd run toward him, and they'd hug each other. They'd love each other. That's the way, and that's what this, every, almost every person that talks about heaven and seeing people come into heaven, they say that's what happens, that your family's there, your great pa, your mom, whoever. Well, they found out this, there was an announcement that this young man was coming that had died. And what had happened was, on earth, this young man had murdered his mother, and his mother was already in heaven, but he had gotten saved, or he was saved, I don't know. But anyway, he dies young, he goes to heaven, and his mom is there. But the mother doesn't wait with the crowd. The mother waits a ways off. Why? Because he wasn't ready to see his mama yet. He still had some guilt issues he needed to deal with. That's what this guy's telling he said, so when the boy gets there and there's people around, they're all hugging him and loving on him. They said, I want to take you to your mom. And he said, I can't see her. He'd killed her. No, you don't understand. You could come see her. So uh, reluctantly, this guy said that the, the, the angel took him over to his mom she was standing by the river and he took her hand. He was crying because he still had such a heart, a broken heart over what he had done to his mama. I mean, can you imagine? And she leads him and they step over into the river of life. And they start submersing in that water and he starts getting healing in his soul. And within just a few moments, he's able to embrace his mother. Why? Because he didn't receive a revelation on this side of his forgiveness. A great example. So when Jesus is preparing his bride, he's not getting you ready by making you clean. He did that on a cross. He's getting you ready by letting you see who you are in him that sounds too good to be true I, you know I know it does and that's why we're going to go to the Bible we're going to go to 1 John and we're going to read two passages out of 1 John to build this case upon it's not just enough to believe this and to think it just because Pastor Tim says it we need the word on it we need what the word says 1 John chapter 3 Verse 2. And I want to remind you who John was. John was the one leaning on Jesus at the Last Supper. John was the one who understand the grace of God through Jesus. John was the one, the only one of the disciples that was with Jesus from his trial to his crucifixion to his resurrection. None of the rest of them. They were all gone. You got John. John was the one who wrote... More books of the Bible than any other apostle. John's the only one they couldn't kill out of all the apostles. They couldn't kill him. John, and what's more significant than anything to me, is John is the one that Jesus looked down from the cross and he said, Son, behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. And he gave Mary to John. When James, his little brother, was right down the road. But he gave responsibility to a man who understood the grace of God and the goodness of God. And John always called himself the disciple Jesus loved. Why? He had a revelation of the love of God. And it's interesting that two of these passages are found in John. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. Why? Because we're clothed in flesh. Come on. 
we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. In other words, revelation is going to flow unhindered by flesh, and you and I will realize that we've been this the entire time. You don't become this when you see him. You became this when you were washed in the blood of the Lamb. One with God in Christ. Man, you go back and you just get your Bible out and look up everywhere it says in Christ. You'll have a revival in your living room when it talks about in Christ. In Christ there is no condemnation. I'm in Christ, therefore I am not and cannot be condemned. Therefore I refuse to condemn myself or allow anyone else to condemn me. This is all about revelation. It's all about what we see. But we can see it now. We can see it here. Listen, what have we heard about the, old, the Bible, right? The Old Testament is Jesus concealed, and the New Testament is Jesus. But let me tell you something. Not only is the New Testament Jesus revealed, but it is you revealed. Everything you read about Jesus is true about you. You're co-heirs with Christ. You are like Him. You had to be made like Him or you would not have qualified for heaven. You're not getting to heaven any other way. You're not getting there because you did mostly good and because the scales fall on the side of goodness. That's not how you're getting there. You're getting there because you are perfect in Him. You have already been made perfect in Him. Well, Pastor, I know, but I, just, you know, I was always taught that it's when we get there, that's when I'm going to be perfect. That's when the full revelation of perfectness will come. But there's a difference between reality and revelation. All I'm asking, and all God, let me back up. All God's asking for us to do is believe reality. What is the reality of our salvation? What is really true about who we are? 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. I think it's when we get there. Well, let's see. By this... Love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is in the present tense, so also are we in the present tense in this world, not in the next world. And this is where people, they get that meat caught in their throat right about here. Let me tell you something. You know what you do when you get meat caught in your throat? Choke it back up and chew on it some more till you can get it down. But don't let it be excuse for you to go back to milk. We, if we want to grow in revelation, then we've got to be able to eat meat. We've got, to, we've got to lay down what we've been taught and what we've thought before the altar of God and say what is true, what is true about you, what is true about me, and that is what I believe and let me tell you something, when we quit working on what we're doing and start working on what we believe, it will change what we do and we will never even notice it. It takes no discipline to be who you are and how you feel. How disciplined do you have to be to smile when someone gives you $1,000? Did you have to work that up? How disciplined do you have to be to hug a child, to love a grandchild? How disciplined do you have to be to answer a phone call for someone you've been wanting to hear for, from for six months? Let me tell you something. There is no discipline needed in the kingdom of God. All that's needed is a reality check of who we are in Him, and it will automatically result in a change of attitude, a change of heart. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. We get saved, and we feel wonderful. And he paid it all. And he takes us from here, and he sets us here. And we're like, wow. Wow. And then we start going to a church, because that's what you do when you get saved. And we start getting, getting told, well, if you're saved, you'll be doing this. And slowly but surely, the devil has infiltrated the religious system and made it about works, and it's made it about what you do instead of about what he's done. And slowly but surely, the person who felt so clean and holy before God begins to feel dirty. They begin to feel unclean. They begin to feel... And they always talk back to that day. I remember how clean I was back then. You are just as clean now as you were that day. The only problem is you've been eaten from the tree of good and evil. Oh. 
I'm going to tell you something. You should only eat from the tree of the good, the good knowledge of God, the knowledge of good, not the tree of evil. It's not your tree. It's not your fruit. But what happens? We begin to eating of this, and people feed it to us readily because they're jealous about the way you feel because they don't feel it anymore. Oh, come on. Christian people. I remember, I remember when we got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, I was so excited. Oh, you couldn't have tied me down. I'm telling you, I was on fire fire and this one couple that had been like pillars of faith in my life from a young from uh uh from he was my royal ranger leader and the and he was always talking to me you know as i was growing up you know uh he was always talking to me and encouraging me in the lord and he had not found out i'd gotten saved right because all my family knew but he didn't know and so i'm like man let's go tell him Susie. let's go tell him what happened i'm expecting him to go glory to god praise god instead <laughs> Instead, I sit down at their table and I tell him what has happened to us. And you know what he says? It is, well, that's good, brother, but I just want you to know that fire is going to burn down. It's going to, it's, it's going, you know, you just got to work to keep putting the embers on. And I just, I just want you to be prepared. I looked at Susie. I said, my God, if that's encouragement. <laughs> Why? Because I stepped into a place with joy that he had not experienced in 25 years. Because he'd been living under the law instead of on top of the law. He'd been living by works instead of by grace. And instead of going, praise God, woo, let's have a prayer meeting. He says, oh, what you got is going to change. Why? Because it changed for me. Can I tell you something? It did change for me. For two months after I got saved, for two months, I don't think I've ever shared this openly, the, all of it. For two months, I felt like I was in a cloud of glory all the time. Who experienced something like that right after you got saved? Let me see you. I was like, wow. I could, like miracles, just, just the Lord would tell me to do something, I would do it, and a miracle would happen. Over and over and over and over. I would go shopping, and I wouldn't take a list. i just walk through the store, praying in tongues. It real cool, grabbing stuff. When I got done, I got the register. It had all been on sale. It all made a bunch of meals. God said, give, give a piece of your furniture away. I gave all my furniture away. I did all of these things. And you know how much time I spent reading the Bible? None. You know how much time I spent in prayer, like knelt down in prayer? None. And I could not understand, why is it? Like these people keep telling me I need to have a prayer life that I need to be reading my Bible, but yet they're in, they can't even get somebody healed. I'm out here, I'm just out here living for Jesus. I'm like, not no disciplines. Listen, there were no disciplines. I was just so on fire for him. I just, whatever I could find, I was doing. If somebody's sick, I go, come here, let me pray for you. I mean, I was just crazy for Jesus. There was no discipline. There was no, there was no spending time to, you know, trying to get revelation from heaven. It was just an awakening to who I was in him. And the voice of God was so clear, just magnificent. And it took church to get that out of me. It took sitting in ministry long enough to finally hear that you got to do something. And then I started thinking, well, I ain't doing what I ought to be doing. I mean, look at this guy. He's doing it. And, ain't, and before long, I'm back to a work. I'm at a works mentality. And almost all that, uh, that power that seems so effortlessly to flow to me just begins to get capped off. Because unbeknownst to me, I'm capping it off with my way of thinking. So you know I can't help it when I read in a book that if you want the anointing, you've got to have discipline. I want lie. That's a lie. All you have to do is know who you are in him. That's all you have to have. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to pray. You're a new creature. The word of God lives in you. Am I saying don't read the Bible? No. But I'm telling you that is not how you get what you got. That's how you feed yourself. That's your food. But that is not a reward system where God says, you spend enough time in the Bible, now I'm going to let my glory rest upon you. It took years for me sitting under ministries that just kept tamping me down, tamping me down, tamping me down. And for years now, I've been rebuilding myself up in the Spirit to get back to the way place I was on the first month. And it's taken years to get there. And I'm still going that direction. And so are you, aren't you? Well, the devil has it figured out. 
He can't do anything about you getting saved, but he can sure do something about what you think if you allow him to. Now, I will give you this bit of advice. You're saying, man, I like that. I will give you some advice. One thing that was completely different for me than is for most Christians is the night I got saved, I quit watching television, I quit listening to the radio, and I quit doing everything. I withdrew from all media, of all entertainment, everything. I just withdrew from it. It wasn't like I felt like I had to. I just didn't have a hunger for it anymore. Now, come on. But slowly but surely, I let religion creep in. And then to fill that void of joy I was having, I'd start watching good television shows, good ones. Nothing wrong with them. Andy Griffith show, great. But it gives you no spiritual life. That's my only advice to you. If you want to walk in a stronger anointing, start cutting things out of your life that's filling you up. And you become more aware of who you already are. You don't have to do anything new. You just start cutting some things out. What's got your mind? What's got your time? <laughs> I've had people come into the church and, 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 uh, and tell me, you know what, Pastor, I have never heard this before. Oh my God, my mind is blown. It's so freeing. I've been, you know, I've been a Bible student for this long. I've been doing this for this long, and I've, I've never heard anything like this. And you know what I will tell them? I'll tell them, here, do this for me. For the next week, don't open your Bible. And don't pray. <laughs> You're like, oh. don't do either one. Don't do either one. Just rest in Him. Just rest in Him. I'm not saying don't talk to the Lord, but don't kneel down and pray. Get out of your disciplines. Get completely away from them because they will lead you astray. Get out of them and just say, God, I'm not praying today, but you know what? I thank you for being with me. The blessing of the Lord's on me. I know I'm not, I'm not reading the Bible today, Lord. I'm not doing my devotion today. I'm not doing all these things today, but you're with me. And just become aware that you are accepted the same whether you read that Bible or you don't. That you are, your righteousness does not move on the needle at all depending on what you do. And then when you open that word after a month, you'll be starving and you'll be like, I want it now. It's no longer a discipline. Now it's my food. Now it is what I want to do. And when you ever get to the place that prayer or the word seems like discipline, back off. Now don't fill it with something else. A warning. Just back off. The Lord's not looking for robots. He's not looking for people who do something so they can get something. When we figure out that the Word of God reveals who we are, then we will be like Jesus, who had limited information from his mama and Joseph. Limited. They didn't have all the great knowledge and revelation that Jesus flowed in in his latter years. You know where Jesus found himself at? in the word you know how you know he found himself in the word well one reason is because when he sat down in 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 his hometown that that saturday and he opened it up to isaiah and he said today the scriptures fulfilled in your ear he had been reading that his whole life and it got inside of him this is who you are the spirit of the lord is going to come upon you and when he does you're going to preach to the poor you're going to heal you're going to deliver right and when he went to the Jordan River, the Spirit of the Lord come upon him. He went, whoop, that's it. I got it. And he began to walk in it. But more than that, if you remember the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, they, were, they had just left Jerusalem. They were so disappointed because Jesus was in a grave, and they just didn't know what to do, and they were walking along, and all of a sudden Jesus appears with them and starts walking with them, and they don't recognize him. But if you go back and read your Bible, you'll see that Jesus began to take them through the law and the prophets showing them who he was and how he must suffer. Jesus already knew all that because he had read all that over the years, preparing himself to be the Lamb of God. He discovered himself, and he discovered his destiny in the Holy Writ. And if you want to know your destiny, you want to know who you are, you've got to go through the Holy Writ. You've got to go to the Word of God. And everywhere it says Christ in you, then you accept it. Christ in me. It is the hope of glory which is Christ on me. Right? Glory in you doesn't do as much good as glory on you. The hope is that the glory that's in you will become the glory that is on you. 
so that when you walk into places and there is a need that the anointing begins to connect like two electric poles when they get close they start sparking back and forth like at the lightning game y'all been there right and the power of god begins to flow that's glory on you the good news is every one of you have the same amount of glory in you as jesus the challenge is we don't have the same glory on us why because we've not wrapped our minds around who we are in him the more we understand who we are in him the more power is released out of our lives and the holier and holier we walk. Who's ever been told, yeah, but you know when a person gets saved, they've got to repent. Right? Who's heard that? There's no repentance? I mean, I'd heard that my whole life until I looked up what repentance meant. And repentance meant change the way you think. Not change. How'd you like that? (laughs) That's the Lord right there. He's like, it's like back up. And, uh, you, may, and you, you know, if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard this before, but it still, it still hinders us to think incorrectly. So we really do need repentance. We need to change the way we think about ourselves. Every, every problem that you and I face as believers that we can't overcome, they're all directly related to identification problems. We don't know who we are yet. We, don't have, we have an identity crisis. We don't know who we are. Every one of them. Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Who's been baptized into Christ? Who's been born again here today? You see that? That's you. You have been baptized, and so have I, into his death. You've already died in Christ. Your sins have already been done away with. Okay? Next verse. Or not the next verse, but yeah, next verse, verse 4. Therefore... Since we've been baptized into his death, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. We are who we are today because of the resurrection. No resurrection, no new birth. The fact... This is all the evidence we need that our sins have been removed and forgiven. Okay, you ready? This is indisputable evidence. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead is immutable evidence that you cannot, he could not have been raised from the dead had he retained the sin. Come on. Rising, he justified. Third day. And scripture. Judged in death, justified in life. You are Christ. (gasps) Christ, anointed. Your identity is in him now. You're inseparable from him. You are in him. He is in you. You are in Christ. And you are anointed with the same anointing as Christ. And you are co-heirs with Christ. And you have been raised to the heavenlies in Christ. And you are with Christ. You are in Christ. Come on. That takes repentance. Because we're like, oh, I can't believe that. That's blasphemous. That's reality. And so many people choke on reality, they never get to it because it's just like too good. There is no way that I can be as good as Jesus. There is no way that God can see me as he sees his son, even though the Bible over and over tells us that's exactly, and not only is that exactly the way he sees us, 
we better hope that's who we are because if not, we are without a hope. I love doing funerals for really righteous, good people. For one reason, they're, they're easy, right? People that have served God from crib to coffin. Them kind of people with works. And one of the, one of the greatest uh, women that I've ever known was my grandmother. I never heard, I honestly never heard say a foul word about anybody. My goodness. How many of y'all can say about that about yourself for the last week? <laughs> never heard it. Never. Never negative talk. Never. It was always grace, love. And I was privileged to do her funeral in the United Methodist Church in Lake Placid a few years ago. And I talked about a good name. How, and how she had a good name. And I love, I always love getting to this part. I'll say, but let me tell you all something. All that good Granny did, and all that genuine love that she expressed, all of that earned her nothing but hell. And people were like, oh! I said, if she was here today, she would tell you she is there with the gl- in glory only because of the blood of Jesus. That is it. That is her only way in. And everything else is to the glory of the Father. Everything else is to bring glory to the Father. But let me tell you, she is not in heaven because she was a good woman. She's in heaven because He's a good God. And because Jesus Christ gave His life. One of the best things we can do for ourselves if we refuse this revelation, and some people do, and I understand that because I did for years. I, understand, I'm not, I, don't, I don't get on people if they refuse it. This is all I say. Make sure you do it all right. What you believe is that if you don't do something right, you're not going to heaven. So make sure you get it all right. And I mean every bit of it. Starting with, let's pull back the collar of your shirt and see if you're wearing a mixed fabric. Because according to the law that says you can't have a tattoo, says you shouldn't wear a cotton polyester blend. Because people want to throw up all the rules they like. Let me give you some other ones. About your worrying, there says in Revelation, everybody loves it where it says homosexuals are a lake of fire, right? Everybody, like, oh yeah, them old dirty gay people, they're going straight to hell. It also says the fearful in there. Oh, wait, whoa, whoa. I'm afraid now, Pastor. (laughs) That's the reality of it. So all I say is if you're on a high horse, ride it high and hard, fast as you can, because eventually, with God's grace, you're going to fall and break your nose. And when you do, you're going to say, I need you, Jesus, and then grace comes in. There's two ways to receive grace. One is to just believe it when you hear it. The other one is to go through enough pain and sorrow and hurt and s- depression. Come on. There's two ways. I went the hard way. What's sad to me is that first month I already had it and I didn't know it. And instead I let people talk me out of who I was in Christ. And start comparing me to everybody else. It sapped the power. But I'm on my way back. Every message I preach gets me that much closer. Every time I think about it, every time I get into the Word, every time I go before Him in faith, I'm getting myself back to a place where me means nothing, He means everything, and I belong to Him, and I am in Him, and there is nothing between me and Him. See, if we don't understand Romans 6, 3, and 4, that we were dead in Him, that we were buried in Him, if we don't really get that, then we can never operate in the newness of life. Because it's a resurrected life we have. The old is gone, and the new has come. But we play around with the old so much that the new loses its shine. We cloud our minds with with nonsense the apostle Paul comes down hard on this 
I'm going to, I said, one day I want to write a book about how Paul disciplined the church, or at least a pamphlet. Because here's how Paul disciplined the church. He got a notice. They sent him a text, the pastor. Brother Paul, <laughs> since you're the overseer of the church, I thought you should know that in our church at Victory Worship Center, we have a man who has actually stolen his daddy's wife and is in an illicit affair with her. We also have problems with homosexuality and, and sexual deviance. We have problems. That's why he's texting Paul. Paul gets the text. He sends back a text. <clears throat> Dear children of God, what does light have to do with darkness? Why are you acting this way? You've been sanctified by him. Fast forward. He gets another letter from Galatia. Brother Paul texts. Oh, Brother Paul, we got a problem. We got some legalizers coming in here and they're starting to tell our people that they've got to do something to be something. That, that, that it isn't just dependent on the work of Christ, that they've actually got to perform, that they've actually got to do. Paul, what did we do about this? You stupid idiots, you foolish Galatians, Paul writes. Do you notice the tone change? We got adultery, we got perversion going on, and he says... That's not who you are. Come on, guys. But we got somebody coming in saying, you got to have the Ten Commandments on your bedroom wall. And he says, you bunch of fools. What in the world are you doing? You, let me tell you something. What religion's done, swap those two around. And they call us a fool because we believe in the fullness of the work of the cross. And they call themselves good because they believe in the law. Mm-mm. Who has bewitched you? Who has put you under a spell? That you were once saved by Jesus alone, now you add to it. I hope that they go ahead and... <clears throat> y'all know what it's going to say, right? How many of y'all read it? I hope they mutilate themselves. Because they were calling for circumcision of the people who were getting saved. Because that was Jewish law. He said, let them cut their own self. That's what I hope they do. My God, what a difference in tone. What a difference in this man of God. Why? Because uh -huh. the danger is not you committing adultery. That's not the danger. The danger is that you think that committing adultery separates you from him. That's the danger. The danger is not that you're going to do something wrong. The danger is thinking if you do something right, you qualify. I'm telling you, he came down hard and heavy. And I'll be honest with y'all guys, I grew up in a church, I had never heard that said, not once. Never. Never. Instead, all I heard my whole life was about the morality that we need to walk in, about how we ought to be doing this, and we ought to have a prayer time, and we ought to be reading our Bible, and we shouldn't ever miss church, and all this stuff. And I never heard one time that somebody get up and said, listen, you fools, this is about Jesus alone. Quit being stupid. It isn't you. It's Him. You got saved by the cross. What are you doing going back to works? What are you doing going back to the law? But you know why Paul did it like that? Because of the same mess you got in that I got in was a result of mixing grace with law. And you know what it produced? It produced half-hearted half Christianity. Sometimes people walk out of the church and never come back. And Satan's going, job done. Just a little bit of poison in the bread. Just a little bit of illness in the soup. Just enough to knock them off balance, to get them dependent on themselves again. Now you're beginning to understand why I tell people, lay your disciplines down for a while. Because you have put too much faith in that. You've been too, too much faith in your performance. You put too much faith. Why, pastor, I've had more than one person ask me, pastor, why don't more preachers preach this? Well, first of all, because they don't believe it's true, because it's too good to be true, which is what the gospel means, by the way, too good to be true news. The number two is you relinquish all control of your people if you tell this message. I can no longer go to you and go, you know what, Steve, you know what, brother, you need to get in church because, you know, things with you and the Lord's not looking good. 
I can't use the law to control you anymore. In fact, the only thing I'm supposed to get angry at you about is when you start depending on yourself instead of Him. That's when I'm supposed to give you the pastoral spanking when you start depending on the law instead of grace. But instead, you get spanked by believing grace. I'm telling y'all, shut that mess off. Don't listen to people that tell you you got to be doing something. That is not true. It is not. It cannot be true. It cannot. It cannot be true if you're going to heaven. It can't be true. Because there's no end to His holiness. There is, it is, it cannot even be reached in this flesh. He has set the bar as Himself. And He said, the only way you're getting in is to be like me. And let me tell you something, you and I cannot do it in the flesh. We can try, we can do all we want to do, we can do... We can do a lot of things, but we will never attain in the flesh what God has in the Spirit. And let me tell you why. Because you, my friend, and I were formed from the dust of the ground, and at that time the dirt had been cursed. So you are living in a cursed temple. This is cursed. That's why it dies. That's why the Bible says that flesh and blood cannot enter or receive the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he can't even visualize the kingdom. That's why Paul says that our our choices are never without this conflict of I want to do the right thing, but I keep doing the wrong thing. The only way we can really walk in the newness of life is to really understand what we have in Him. And there is no time span that you have to cross to be faithful, to be able to get a ministry in the Lord. There's no price you've got to pay for an anointing. Let me tell you something. The price was paid by Jesus on a cross for the anointing. It's His anointing. It is not your anointing. He just lets you have it so that you can steward His anointing. Now, when it comes to managing people, we require faithfulness. But when it comes to your ministry before the Lord, He gave it to you and promoted you already. You don't need me to say it's okay for you to win souls or pray for the sick. God said, I made you okay when I saved you. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. So you're being prepared as the bride today. Prepared to change the way you think. I want you to just think a minute. Just, just, it's interesting the Lord chooses the bride and the groom to explain the church and Jesus. How many of you, have you if, maybe this hasn't happened to you, but you know of this happening. You've gotten the bride and the groom and maybe they're wedding night, right? They get into that holy chamber of intimacy. It is the best reflection of our relationship with God. Intercourse, sexual intercourse is the greatest expression of spiritual truth that you'll ever have. Because what you experience in that moment of high pleasure is a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of eternity with Him. People say, well, Pastor, there ain't going to be sex in heaven. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to let heaven's better than sex. Amen. Hey, you men should have said amen. amen. The women saying it. Y'all, I can't believe he said six in here. I said sex. I just said it again. (laughs) With Jesus is better than your best time with your best person in your best days with your best body. It, It outshines it. It's given to us to show the unity between Christ and the church and the beauty that exists. And for that one moment, at least, most people, at least for that one moment, they are unified, husband and wife. It might be fighting 15 minutes later, and they might be fighting 15 minutes before, but at that one moment of intimacy, their hearts are entwined together, and they are showing what Christ in the church looks like. And it's private, and it's personal, and it's beautiful. But how many brides on their wedding night, I don't want to take my dress off. I don't, want to take, I don't want to unveil myself in front of you. I'm just not pretty. Oh, come on, y'all. 
Just don't think I'm beautiful enough for you. And the groom, what's the groom saying? Come on, baby, you are hot. You are good looking, baby. I love, but I'm a little curvy. I love your curves, honey. Right? What is the husband? The groom is pleased with the bride. And he's trying to get the bride to understand, I am pleased with you. Please unveil yourself. Let me tell you something. It's a message from heaven today. The groom is saying to the church, I am pleased with you. Please quit covering up and hiding yourself from me and thinking that you're at fault. I am adoring you. I love every ounce of you. I love every curve. I love, oh, come on. Y'all like, my God, Pastor. Taking my wife straight home. <laughs> That's the truth of it. And it's not humility for the bride to say she's not worthy of the groom. It's a slap in the face of the groom. It's his decision if you are beautiful or not, not yours. And if your groom says you are beautiful to me, then you should expose yourself in all of your beauty and open yourself up to a fullness and a relationship with the groom. How many of you men remember your wedding night? How many of you were going, you know what, this ain't what I was thinking it was going to be. I didn't know you had a freckle over there over your back on that. I didn't know you had, I didn't know you had a wrinkle there. No, no, no. What are you thinking about? One thing, consummation. What's the woman thinking? I'm hoping I'm good enough. I'm hoping I'm prepared enough. I hope I did everything right. I'm hoping I smell good. I hope I look good. And what's the man thinking? All he wants to do is hit the sheets. Y'all wouldn't have survived in Jewish days if this bothers you. You know what they used to do in Jewish days when people got married? They would gather around the house with tambourines. And as soon as the act had been completed, they all started shouting and cheering. It's like a party, man. Woo! And that's a true picture of the church of Jesus Christ. It happens in solitude, it happens in privacy, but it's celebrated openly. And it's not something that you shouldn't talk about. You talk to your kids about sex like this, they'll begin to understand what sex is really supposed to be about. And they won't sell themselves out before their commitment to their covenant time because they'll understand what a covenant really is. And anything apart from marriage, bed, sexuality is a slap in the face of what God's done. It's just, it's just messing up the whole thing. God set it for a purpose. He set it there for a reason. So this takes me back to the beginning, right before I came here. <clears throat> As would have it, I was in the shower, <laughs> naked before the Lord, in my private place, in my private time. I will never forget this as long as I live in our home in Lake Placid, right before we came here. And I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, I am about to unveil my bride. Just like that. Unveil my bride. And just this week, do I understand what he was saying? He was saying, I'm about to let my bride see herself. As she is. You know when you're wearing that veil and you look in the mirror, what do you see? A lot of little squares. But the groom comes, or I don't know who's supposed to do it, the groom or the father. Flip the father opens the veil, don't he? Yeah. Well, that's good right there. <laughs> I'll be next week. <laughs> the father, when he presents the bride to the groom, he flips the veil over so that there's nothing between them anymore. When the father flips the veil over, who do we see? The groom, which is Jesus. And when we see him, we see who? Ourselves. We don't need a greater revelation of how good Jesus is. We need a greater revelation of how we are in him. Everybody, I mean, if Jesus saved you, you don't need anybody to tell you, Jesus is good. You're like, yeah, I kind of know that. How about this? You are good. How about you are valuable and you are loved and you are accepted and he desires you as you are. Not some dream fantasy you have from reading the Bible like people read Cosmopolitan, looking at those pictures and saying, oh, look, I'm not a Proverbs 31 woman. You know what you are? You're a woman that God saved for his glory. 
And that groom's there with the bride, and she's saying, I don't want to avail. And he's like, do you realize how much money we just spent on that wedding? Do you realize how much I paid for this hotel room? Do you realize I've been waiting for this to happen? I'm not ready. Well, if you're not ready, when are you going to be ready, honey? I need a time. I need something. <laughs> and in the same way, our Father, uh, Jesus, our groom, is looking at us saying, you know what, I want you to understand who you really are. I want you to stand before me as my bride. And we say, well, I'm just not ready. He says, do you know what I paid for you? Do you know what I did for you? Do you know I recreated you new? You are not what you do. You are who I made you to be, which is holy and right and upstanding before me without a spot and without a wrinkle. Religion says, yeah, God's coming after a church. With no spot or wrinkle, better get them wrinkles out. Let me tell you something. There's only one wrinkler out who's going to get the wrinkles out of you, and that's when Jesus saved you, and he made you a new creation. And that new creation that lives inside of you has no wrinkles and has no spots. If God's waiting on the church to clean herself up to come back, then buy your funeral plot today because you aren't going to heaven. He's not waiting for the church to clean up. <laughs> he's waiting for the church to realize how clean she is. Because he's not looking for a bride that doesn't want to unveil herself and that doesn't want to expose herself and that wants to hide from him and doesn't want to run to the throne. What does he want? He wants that bride that goes, I've been waiting on this. I know you desire me and I'm coming to bed with you right now. Bam, into bed. Clothes on the floor. That's what a groom wants. Am I, is somebody with me? That's what a groom wants. He wants her ready. Me and you, baby. I've been waiting. Jesus is not looking for us to come all humbly and, oh God, I, Jesus, I just don't know. I don't think I can measure up. No, 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 no. He loves you too much. He wants to remove the veil off of our eyes so that we can see who we are in Him, so that we will understand as He is, so are we right now in this world. Nothing between me and God. I want you to say that with me. I want the worship team to come out. Say this with me. There is nothing between me and God. <laughs> oh, I'm His bride. Say it. I'm His bride. He's my groom. He knows me intimately. And He desires me passionately. And He knows me better than I know me. Listen, we should quit second-guessing God's taste. How dare we look at God and go, you know what, your taste is just substandard. How dare? No, instead, let's be the bride. Let's be ready for the return of the groom. Let's be open to Him waiting for that final day, that final union. And my dream is if we get raptured, my dream is that our entire church is one of the first groups to the throne of God. There you go. My dream is that you step out with your righteous robe on because you realize who you are in Him and you are all taken off. And there ain't one person. Listen, it's okay to be slow, but I just don't want to be. I mean, they can make it. They're going to make it eventually. <laughs> Nobody gets left out. God is good. Yes, he is. Even people who refuse this message, he's still going to let them learn. They're just going to learn on the other side. Oh, yeah, we're going to learn over there just like we learn here. It'll be without the limits we have. True. Praise God. We'll retain a lot better. We're going to have to, either we're going to learn who we are in him here or we're going to learn over there. If we learn it here, then we, we lift up that robe right to the throne of grace where we will take our crowns and toss them before Him. And we will sing glory to the Lamb. Yes. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The great I Am. Oh, I already feel the anointing on me right now. He is, Stand up with me. He is worthy. I want you to come on up these altars right now. Don't, don't delay. There is an anointing in this place of the King. There's a